New Hope Outreach Ministries, making a difference by taking the gospel from word to action. And now, today's message. It saves us a lot of heartaches and headaches down the road there, whatever, so, but God is good. So I hope you pray you had a good week, amen, and and all the good stuff this week, a lot of good stuff, stuff is going on and and still crazy stuff going on in the world, but that's the world in which we live and still it's not going to change God, amen. God's still the same today, yesterday, and forever, and he's going to change not, amen. So we just thank God for all the good stuff he's doing. Amen. Praise God. Last week, I shared with you about finding and knowing your purpose. Amen. As Theo said, you know, that God don't already has the plan. Only thing we need to do now is tap into what he have already done so we can be able to understand our purpose. And once we understand our purpose here on this earth and while we're here, why God allow us to be doing it, uh, some of the stuff we're doing and how, and how he has worked with us, to allow us to be where we are is absolute a miracle. So by the grace of God. So he's done a lot of great things for us and et cetera. And when you, when you understand your purpose in life, everything changes for you. I can speak for myself because once I understood my purpose of being here, um, everything started changing for me, really. Uh, I became more attentive. I started listening to people more. I started listening for direction in which God was leading me and guiding me and directing me. And then I realized the scripture in the book of Psalms said the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered by the Lord. And then what it did for me, it helped me to stop fighting God and stop really uh, fighting against a lot of stuff that was going on or whatever because I knew for a fact God was was working the situation out. I remember and then I just came to a conclusion, whatever came that was thrown against me, regardless of what it was, that I know for a fact God was with me. He was not allowing even the negative things that was happening to me or whatever, that he was still there with me to take me through the process. Only thing I had to do now is just follow him and walk out the process. Look at your name and say, walk out the process. There's nothing to worry about. There's no fear. There's nothing to be concerned about, whatever. I know that's hard to do when things are thrown against you, when you're thrown to the wolves or whatever. But even when you're thrown to the wolf, God is going to work it out. I remember, like I say, you know, many times in the military, traveling different places, whatever, you know, you have to go different places and do different things or whatever. And there was a lot of challenges or whatever. But what always gave me confidence when those challenges came, God, you created this opportunity for me. So now I need to do what? I just need to get the grace of God now to walk this thing out, whatever. Everything I need to do, everything that I need, the resources, the people, the things or whatever, it's available for me. You made it available. Now I have to be, keep my eyes open and take advantage of what you have made available to me and not walk in fear. And every time I've done this, I'm telling you, it was just absolutely amazing. Because I remember one time the, I had to do this so called NBC training for the entire um, entire um, battalion, and that was which is about pretty close about, about 500 NCOs, because the AVM that was the biggest, largest uh, maintenance battalion in the army or whatever AVM Aviation Maintenance Battalion is called it, and so I had to do. And, um, they put me in charge of this particular area, and what was amazing to me, I was in charge of operation, but there should have been a task for what we call S3. S3 took you all the training and all that good stuff. But here I am, I'm support ops. I supposed to be working, um, working tasks as far as maintenance and all other stuff. But the sergeant major wanted me to put me in charge of NBC. And it was a little bit concerned to me why you want me to do it. But anyway, I got the grace and got the, uh, got the support I needed. And I went and talked to all the, um, I was in charge of support ops. And um, I talked to all my NCO. I said, listen to me, guys. You know and I know this is not our lane. This is not something we're supposed to be doing. But I need your support to make this successful. And so by the grace of God, so they said, okay, we'll support you. 
because I need those guys and support to help me do some of the tasks we need to get done. And by the grace of God, we was able to do it, pull it off, and was very successful by the grace of God. Amen? So, but I'm telling you, God has a way of doing things, preparing you, throwing you underneath the bus or whatever, so to make you become successful if you just trust him or whatever. And, and I thank God for the, for the good things that, that he's done for me because for the simple fact is he's always uh, put me in a situation to be successful. Amen. So, and I just follow his leading. And this morning we want to share with you about a purpose-driven heart. Having a purpose-driven heart. Look at your neighbors. Having a purpose-driven heart. And that's so important to have a purpose-driven heart. If you really want to live a long time and be successful in life, um, when you find purpose in your life, everything changes by the grace of God. Everything changes for you. Again, like I said, I know for me, it's changed for me. And when you purpose things in your heart, God will give you the grace and strength to be able to carry them about if you purpose it in your heart. In the book of Daniel this morning, you guys have read the scripture, Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. It says here that, um, it's about Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the princes of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, now Daniel here, if you look into the background of Daniel, Daniel here was doing it at the time was in exile. In other words, the children of Israel had began, had disobeyed God and, and God kept warning them to continue to keep disobeying him and not follow him, whatever, where things were going to lead them. And just like most people today, they don't believe that bad things can happen to them if they don't follow God, okay? And I'm telling you, listen to me, listen to me, and listen to me good. I don't care what the world do. It does not matter what the world do. God has his divine order on how things are supposed to be done in this world. And too many people today are looking what the world is doing, basing their decision, basing their lives, basing everything they do based upon what the world thinks. It's not what the world thinks. It's what God thinks. God has the last say-so and the final say-so over everything. So if you really want to get the truth, want to know the whole matter of the whole situation, you better consider God versus listening to the world. Don't listen to the media. Don't look at your neighbors. Don't look at your cousin. Don't look at your brothers. Don't look at your sisters. You better start looking to God because God is the one you have to stand before one day. And the, and the most important thing, and when you do it God's way, you will always end up with God's results if you just trust him or whatever. Uh, whatever, but Daniel was in was in exile. In other words, they've been the Assyrian people brought some amazing affliction upon the children of Israel. Matter of fact, they even skinned some of them alive. And the reason why they got into that situation, not because God wanted them to, because of their own disobedience, not listening to what God told them to do, what their enemies want to do. That's why He told King Saul to get rid of. They what we call the Amalekites. It was not that the point of God hated the Amalekites. It's the fact that no matter here, what the Amalekites had done earlier to the children of Israel, when they were leaving Egypt, the, the Amalekites would attack the afflicted one, the weak one, the one that couldn't keep up with the, with the caravan of the, of the other soldiers, whatever, the other people. They was, the Amalekites would, would take those people and torture them, mistreat them, abuse them, and took advantage of them or whatever. They the ones. They were the ones that were lagged behind or whatever. And God never got how they treated the children of Israel. So he told Saul, he said, Saul, listen to me. You need to get rid of all the Amalekites. Don't leave none of them, not even the kids. And what Saul did, Saul did like most people do, he's going to rationale, rationale, begin to look and say, well, I'm going to keep the good and get rid of the bad. That's not what God said. That's the point I'm making. You cannot, you cannot ignore what God is telling you. If it's in your heart to do it, then you need to do it. 
It's not about what people think. The world is going to think what they want to think. But you got to learn how to say, God, it's your way or the highway. And when you do it God's way, it's always going to be a good result. But here Daniel was in exile and nothing he could control. He was not in control of anything but his own heart. And that's the thing that we got to be concerned about, being in control. It does not matter what people think and say about whatever, how you control what goes on in your heart. Just like when getting mad and getting upset with people. People can say whatever they want to, to say to you. But it's up to you as a believer, as a person, to decide what they say, how you're going to allow it to affect you as a person. Can't nobody make you mad unless you give them permission to make you mad. And the reason why we get upset with things, because the significant we placed upon the perpetrator or the person that's speaking to us. That's why a family can say the same thing a person on the street can say to us, and we'll take it to heart. Why? Because of the significance that we placed upon what they said to us. The people in the street, it don't matter. They can say the same thing. You blow it off, it'll run off you like water on the duck's back. It don't matter. But let your daughter, let your son, let your husband, let your brother, let your sister, your blood brother, sister, mom, dad say something. Say the same thing to you, and man, we take it to heart. Why? Because of the significance we placed upon it. If we look at it and say, guess what? I'm not going to be moved by what people do or what people say. I'm going to control my heart. And you control your own heart by the grace of God. Daniel was a man of conviction. Not only was he a man of conviction, conviction, but also Daniel was a man of commitment, of confidence, and courage by the grace of God. Whenever he made a decision, he stuck with it. That's why it's important for you as a believer, what you do in peacetime, that's why in the army, whatever, the way you train in peacetime, believe it or not, it's not going to change when you get in war. If you're a slacker in peacetime, you're going to be a slacker in war. Whatever you do in bad times, when the pressure's on, if you're not careful, you're going to do the same thing. If you're crazy in Huntsville and leave crazy in Huntsville, when you get to Birmingham, what you going to be? You're still going to be crazy. It's probably not going to change between 100 miles between Huntsville and Birmingham. So therefore, you want to make sure you do a self-examination now and prepare yourself. Because God has given us an opportunity now to get things in place at the pressure come. Because listen to me, it's coming. It's just not a matter how, it's just a matter when. Because the world is trying to do everything they can right now to shut this church stuff down. Because this is the only thing that they can't control is God. They can control people, but they can't control God. If they can control the people that know God, they figure they can control God. But that, that's total deception too. But God can always make a way. And that's why it's important now to get yourself in place Get a chance to study, get a chance to prepare or whatever. So in that way, so when the heat is on, you'll be able to make some good decisions by the grace of God. Daniel himself stood strong in his belief. You can't be one way on a Sunday and then when you get around your friends or another way during the week. You can't laugh and drink and party with the boys and the girls Monday through Saturday. Then expect to come to church on Sunday time a holy than now. Sam, we're going to shut the house now. It don't work that way. It can become a gymnastic. It can become gymnastic. It can be a show and a fashion and entertainment for people. God is not looking for entertainment. God is looking for, for the spirit of God to move in the church. And the only way they're going to be able to move that, we as the people have to yield ourselves to God so God can work with us and through us so he can bring the glory and honor to himself. And I'm telling you, when we do that, Every day the church, when you come to church, church won't be like going to a mall, going to a funeral, or going to another reception or whatever. You'll be able to go there, revive, you leave that revive, you'll go out and do some great things for the kingdom of God by the grace of God. So we got to have some strong belief. Why did Daniel purpose in the heart that he was not going to do that? Simple. Because he was not going to file himself with the king's feet. Because what, they were, what the king wanted him to do 
was to eat stuff, do stuff that had been sacrificed to idols. Then you knew it was wrong. And this is so important to you. When you know it's wrong, if you know for a fact that something is wrong, don't allow people to talk you into doing something that's going to violate your conscience. If it's wrong now, it's going to be wrong tomorrow. It's going to be wrong next Sunday. And that's why a lot of people say, well, you know, I just did it just for it. It only takes one time. It only takes one time. And one time, once you open that door one time, it makes it easy for you to open that door again. But once the door is shut, if you don't open yourself up to it, that's why it's important to keep the door shut. Bad company will corrupt good morals. You can't, you can't play with dirt and play with dust and not expect, without goggles, expect not to get into your eyes. It's going to change you. And because we're in this nature, we're in this flesh, it's easy for us to gravitate to the things of the world than doing righteous things. It's easy for it because that's what the flesh wants to do anyway. It wants to do the things of the world. And if we're not careful, guess what? We'll find ourselves doing it. But Daniel made a decision where? In his heart. He had a conviction in the heart. And that's what you got to do. There are certain things you got to decide now. I don't care what happened. When it happened, the way it happened, I'm not going beyond this point. That's why sometimes people get a budget. That's why they, that's why they can't maintain a budget. Because they say, that, well, that's what, guess what, I'm going to spend to this point. I'm not going to go beyond that point. But all of a sudden, something come up, a good deal come up. Look at your name, it's a good deal. A good deal come up, now it's going to take them beyond that budget. And guess what they do? They, break the, they bust the budget, okay? And guess what? Then Nanny tells them, say, well, Nick, I'm not going to do this again. Something else come up. Guess what? They'll never be able to maintain a budget because they've gotten so used to busting that bu- budget. But once you get to that point, I don't care what happened, what go, I'm not going beyond this. I'm not going to do this because this is my conviction. I'm going to do this with my life. This is where I choose to live. I'm not, I don't care what they do. I'm not going to do it. Those are the type of decisions we need to make. But we live in a society where I say, where God understands. You, he understands, but you understand too. And if you understand the fact that if you go beyond your conviction, you're walking in unrighteousness. That's what God want, want, has to convict you about it because you know for a fact He's not going to convict you about things that's right. All the things you've been convicted about are things you know that are, un, that are not righteous or whatever. And when you do that, guess what? Things will change. When we decide to honor God with our decision, God will give us, make it possible for us to hold to those decisions and carry them through. When you look in the book of, uh, book of Mark, Mark chapter 11 and verse 23, it says, so whatsoever things when you pray. Let's turn to that scripture, if you will. Mark eleven twenty three. It's important. This not this does not only apply just living. This also applies to any situation that you're going to encounter for the rest of your life. Because there are traps out there have been set for us, and we got to be prepared when those traps come. How we're going to get around those traps? He said, Verily I say unto you, that whatsoever I say unto you, I say, un- I say unto, unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea and not doubt, not doubt in the heart. That's 1123. 1123. And then, but it goes on that, but shall believe that those things which you shall say shall come to pass, it should happen. See, that's why it's important not to start when you say stuff, do what you're going to say. Do what you say you're going to do. Don't say stuff that you don't plan to do. It does not matter if it hurt the feelings. Are you listening to me? It don't matter. You be honest with yourself. Because when you say stuff, you want to stick with, you want to be a man of, and a woman of your word. You don't want to say stuff just, just to appease them, 
just to satisfy them. No, this is what's wrong with the world today. It would tell people the truth. The truth is going to set them free. It may not be good for you, but it's going to, may not be good to you, but it's going to be good for you. And what you want to do is learn how to be a woman and a man of integrity. Say it. If you say it, it's going to come to pass. Whatsoever thing you say, you believe it, it's going to come to pass. But if, if you're so used to stretching the truth, prevaricating, becoming a pathological liar, whatever you say is not going to come to pass. You're not going to believe that, especially when you get in trouble. And that's why it's important whenever you get sick or whatever, because I'm telling you, the devil going to accuse you of this stuff. He's going to bring this junk to you when you start going through some, some crazy experience. When I was dealing with cancer or whatever, guess what? He would bring all types of crazy thoughts to my mind or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, he could not deal with me because for a fact, I always done what I said I was going to do. If I said it, I believe it. And he knew that. But he was doing everything under the sun. Because, see, when you're dealing with this type of sickness, you're not only dealing with the physical aspect, but, man, you're dealing with enormous amount of negative thoughts that are coming against you. He bombard you every day with thoughts about this and that and whatever and whatever. What about this and whatever? Just like when I was going through some of the stuff, you cannot imagine all the stuff that my body went through. Balls and sores and stuff like that broke all over my legs and all that stuff like that all over my body. It was just, if some of this stuff, if you had seen some of the stuff, it had been hard for you to imagine going through it and looking at me now by the grace of God. But I believe by the grace of God, that this was a process, I was going to get through it. That was not in the head, that was in the heart. And when you get it in your heart, the devil can't take it from you. But he can change your thought, but he can't change your heart. That's why you have to purpose in your heart how you're going to live, the way you're going to live, the, even the way you're going to die. You can purpose in your heart how you're going to do it. Just like Jesus said, no man take my life, but I lay my life now. You don't have to fall for anything. You are in control. We're not in control, but you're in charge of your own life. By the grace of God. And once you begin to know this in your heart, I'm telling you, and that's why I say when my people say, well, this, that, and that, and I tell people, my word is this. I don't know what's in your heart. Only then I can see the external, your action or whatever, because your action is a reflection or what's going on inside of you. There's a lot of people say one thing in the, in, the, in the midst of company and crowds and whatever, but that's not really what happened in your heart. What's in your heart is going to come to pass. But God is good or bad and different. And when you get in your heart, guess what? Because just like when I was growing up, guess what? It was in my heart to travel, it was in my heart to be successful, to move on in my life. Guess what? God, God is doing it. Why? It's not in my head, it's in my heart. I believe that, and I know that. And that as a result of that, I make my decision based upon what I have purpose in my heart. Not based upon the influence coming from the world, the temptation that coming from the world, because there are men of them. But if this, that temptation of that situation is not going to help me, like I tell the girls, if it's not going to help you to get the way you need to go, then you probably need to leave it alone. Or walk away from it. Because at the end of the day, you're not going to be happy with the outcome of it. And can't nobody make you happy or make you sad or whatever. Just like happiness, whatever. Can't nobody make you happy. You have the purpose in your heart. You're going to be happy regardless of what come. Broke, money, no money. Husband, no husband. Wife or no wife. It don't matter. You have to decide. That's why David said that this is the day. Not tomorrow, but this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And not based upon circumstance. And not based upon what I have and don't have. Based upon what God has blessed me with. Based upon what your purpose in your heart. And that's why the devil does everything he can to make sure you don't get it in your heart. He don't care how you live. Long is not right. You can play the game all day long, but when the end of the scoreboard, that's going to determine who the winner, who the loser. 
Life is a big game, and people are playing it. And you don't want to play that game to the, with life that people are playing. Because I'm telling you, men are going to lose out in the end, unfortunately. When we purpose in our heart, by the grace of God, there's going to be a spiritual conviction and a spiritual com uh, commitment. And everything that you do, believe it or not, has a purpose behind it. You don't do it unless there's a purpose behind it. Why do you eat? The whole purpose is not to feel hungry. Huh? Why do you drive your car? The purpose behind it is because it's much easier to drive the car than to walk. I can get there faster. So everything, every decision you make has a purpose behind it. And sometimes people take those purposes and they'll be working hidden agendas and all types of stuff. And see, and the thing about it, what is a purpose-driven heart? A purpose-driven heart is a person who has made a decision and determined they will not be moved. And the word purpose, for those that are taking notes, the word purpose means that to set something and determine something. You set it and determine. None, I'm not going to change it. I will not be moved from this. That's why I said when I told you I had no intention of ever getting married. Never intended. Because of all the stuff I had seen over the years. Growing up. Being around. Friends and other family, whatever. Because it was a big game when it came to a relationship. And I said, you know what? I don't want to go through that gymnastic. I'm not going to do it. I had no intention. But then, then again, in my heart, I wanted to get married. And then I made a decision in my heart. Said, if I do it, I'm only going to do it one time. I didn't come up with no prenuptial, prenuptial agreements. Are you listening to me? Either all the way or no way. You can't go by all this stuff. Either you do it, you don't do it just on a piece of paper. That's why a lot of people get divorced. Because it's on a piece of paper. It's not in the heart. You is you in it to win it. That's why he said, for sickness and health, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, until what? Until death. Until do us part. That's a commitment. And when you make that commitment, you're making that commitment in your heart. Now, don't get me wrong. People change that every day. Well, people probably listen by to radio or whatever. They probably say, well, pass your own time. I don't understand. I don't understand. But I do understand this. When you make a commitment, you should stick with it. Don't commit to something that you don't plan to stick with. And marriage or any relationship is not a sprint. It's a journey. And that, and that journey is going to take you different roads and down different roads or whatever. And you got to be prepared to deal with that, those roads that you come in contact. Detours and X's and all types of stuff. Good days, bad days, broke days, happy days, financial days, sick days, crying days, loving days. There are going to be some days. But when you purpose in your heart that you're going to stick with it, guess what? God will give you the grace to do it. When you purpose in your heart, you're objecting in life to set, to live your life in such a way that is working you toward the goals that God has set for you. See, the goals are already, believe it or not, everything you want, believe it or not, God wanted for you as well. People don't understand that. Everything I'm doing in my life, believe it or not, John wants to do it too. He wants it more so than I do. And the only thing I have to do is set measurable goals so I can reach, so I can be able to fulfill my purpose and follow God's plan for my life by the grace of God. If I do that, guess what? I will be successful. And not only that, but also I continue to place, um, place every word I speak, every word, everything I do, I I express it through my action or whatever. 
If my actions don't express it, I'm just talking. But I should be able to live what I say and say what I and speak, mean what I say and say what I mean by the grace of God. What kind of heart? Now, if you studied the word heart, the Bible lists us total of 50 different t- hearts in the Bible. Different types of heart. 50 different types of heart. There's a whorish heart. There's a immorality, unforgiving heart, all different types. But it's a total of 50 of them, 50 of them. But what is the type of heart that God admire? The heart that God admire is a generous heart. Because with a generous heart, by the grace of God, guess what? You're generous with your time. Everything about your life is generous. You're not, you're not selfish with your time. You're not selfish with your possession or whatever. Anything God asks you to do, you're generous with it. That's why a generous heart is the type of God, type of heart that God wants to have, a generous heart. Because it's just like Zacchaeus. Remember in the book of St. Luke, the 19th chapter, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. You've heard, you probably may have heard this, may not. If God can get into a man's pocket, he can get into his heart. The most challenging thing for a man to do is give up his money. But if a man give up his money, he'll give it to keys to his car. He'll give you keys to his house, all this other stuff. But why money? It's just something about that control over money. Look at the young rich ruler. When he asked, what can he do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him, said, look, Go and give all you have to the poor. And the Bible says he walked away sad. He didn't want to do that. Didn't want to do that. Not realizing by giving up something, you're going to get more than what you give up. But see, the mindset is this. No, a bird in the hand is better than a bird in the bush. You need to let all the bushes go and the birds too. Just let it go. And ask God to bring his birds in, his bushes in. Forget about your birds and your bushes. Ask God to bring his in. And, and God always would do more than, than you can exceed. And even over there in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, you've seen this. Um, what type of giver does God love? The Bible says he loves a cheerful giver. And whatever you do, the purpose in your heart. People are going to be amazed when they stand before God's kingdom. All what they God have blessed them with. If they had taken what they have, some of what they've gotten and invested into the kingdom of God, they're going to look back and say, man, what I could have had and more I could have had if I only just trust God. Because just think about God give us the power to get well. All of it comes from him. And we trust God with whatever. Guess what? He's going to take care of you. People say, well, you know, I'm not going to do all this. I'm not going to give all this. Because guess what? What you don't understand, you're just a steward over it anyway. He just lets you have it. Let you borrow it. It really don't belong to you. Because how many coffins, how many hearses you seen when people die, take a U-Haul behind them? They can, but they ain't going away. Have you even heard people being buried in their cars or whatever? There's one singer or whatever, before they, before they buried her, I think they changed her, changed the outfit about three or four times. A coffin and everything. That's great. That's wonderful. But what about the kingdom of God? All that's look good in the eyes of man. You are not want to be concerned about being I please a man. What we want to do is make sure that we get everything straight with God. Because he is the one that we have to stand. The scripture said, don't fear him to save and destroy the body, but fear him to save and destroy both body and soul. That's one we need to be concerned about, by the grace of God. God loves a, a cheerful giver. Then over there in the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16, God told the children of Israel, he said, therefore circum-, he said, circumcise therefore the skin of your heart. And be no more stiff-necked. 
In other words, circumcised means remove. Remove all the stuff in your life that you should that should be removed. Now, what what do you mean remove, Pastor John? The Holy Spirit will tell you everything you need to get rid of. If he if he haven't told you, you have an accident. Because he's going to tell you. Just like you know it, the Holy Spirit knows it too. And he's going to point it out to you. Now, he's going to leave it up to you. Just like house cleaning. Clean out the garage. He don't want me to get rid of certain things. I said, no, I don't want to get rid of that. I want to hold on to it. She said, well, you, you're becoming a hoarder. Holding on to stuff. But that's where people are. The Holy Spirit will bring it to us, our attention. Instead of us getting rid of it, we're going to hold on to it. Guess what? Get rid of it so you can get something else. And everything you've gotten rid of, guess what? God always replaces with something better. Always replaces with more. So what are you losing? Really nothing. But in our minds, we, don't, we think we're giving up something or whatever. And stuff we haven't used in years. Just sitting there collecting dust. Amen? And what is a stiff neck? A stiff neck is a person that's unwilling to do what other people say. That's what God was telling, Moses was telling the children of Israel. Stop it. Why don't you just get uncircumcised? Get this stuff out of your heart. God is not going to take it out of heart because that's there. You placed it there. He didn't put it, he didn't put it there for you. You placed it there for yourself. So you are the one to remove it. Huntsville Police Department didn't put that stuff in my garage. I placed it there. They're not going to come in and take it out. Even though they're the policemen. So if I want to remove, who's, who's going to remove it? I'm going to remove it. I'm the one place. The stuff that's in your heart, God didn't place it there. So if you want it out, guess what? When I wanted to stop drinking and cussing and whatever and all stuff, I asked God to do it. And God just gave me the grace to overcome it. And guess what? But the bottom line is, I had to do it. I had to stop doing it myself. Drinking and all other stuff, whatever. I thought it was good to, you know, have to work a hard day's work to be able to go in and get me a, and pop that whoosh, and pop that bill. See, you guys don't remember the days back in coat four to five days and and the, and the, and the slits days and and all those and BW days, Budweiser days, and Blue Ribbon, P, PBR, Pap, Pap Blue Ribbon and whatever. And when I was in the military, they'd give it that uh, we'll call that watered down beer, because they didn't want to get the get the, get the strong stuff because we had, go out there and act the fool or whatever. So to make sure it was watered down, so. All your beer in the military when you first went through base training was all PBR. It was all watered down. Because they didn't know for a fact, guess what? If you get crazy off of this, then you totally jacked up. But some of them did, though. They still were jacked up. Because they drank so much of it to the point where it just they did, did them in or whatever. The bottom line is, guess what? You remove it. And that's the way it is with God. God's going to not going to do it. And see, in the point of view, people say God is in control. No, God is in charge. If God was in control, he'll, he'll pull it all out. He'll do it for you. He, he's going to tell you what to do, then he's going to leave it up to you to do it. Well, God, he's not going to make you do anything. He's in charge of stuff. He's not going to make you. Just like in the military, they don't say who's in control of this organization. He wanted to know who's the OIC or the NCIC in charge. If you're in charge of it, then guess what? We can talk to you. That means if, if you was in control of it, that means that everything happened good or bad, you are responsible for it. You can't control what people do. You can be over them. You can tell them. You can advise them. But ultimately, you're the one that make the decision. That's the way God do it. He don't make us do anything. Because he could have made Adam and Eve obey him if he had wanted to. He's God. Amen. He told them what to do. He was in charge. And, and he placed Adam and Eve in charge of the garden. 
And guess what? It was up to them how they want to live. Just like you in your house. You don't, and you not, don't control your house. I don't control 1,000 Henderson Road. That means if I control everything, Hillary would do everything I want her to do. And you know that don't happen. <laughs> if I was in control. Hello? I'm in charge, but I'm not in control of the house. Everything that happened in that 1,000 Henderson Road, it'd be done my way. Nobody else's way. Everything that happened has to come get by my approval first. No. I wear the pants in the house. She wear pants too. So guess what? I'm not in control. I'm just in charge. And see, when you know that, understand that, guess what? Then you can understand why things are going. Like the world is in, God's in charge. He's not controlling. You think God is controlling all this stupid stuff that's going on in the world today? All this killing and all this stuff? God, why would he, why would he be in control so that people are killing each other every day? He's in charge telling people what to do and what not to do, but he's leaving it up to people to do what they want to do. They know they have a conscience because guess what? We were created in his image to be like him. We can think like him. We can make decisions for like him. We can choose right from wrong just like him. Because we are created in his image by the grace of God. And if we do that, guess what? Things will change by the grace of God. And then over there in the, in, in, in the point of it is when God, God don't, don't control his children. He don't control us. He empowers us. That's the difference. He tell you what to do. He didn't make me get up this morning out of bed this morning. Well, well, John, you need to go and do what you need to do. No. He leaves it up to me. And because of what I know what he wants me to do, guess what? I do it willfully. Remember in the, book of, in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 1, he said, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured. So therefore, it's up to me what I want. How I want to yield to him. And as I yield to him, like Jesus. Jesus didn't come in. He said, I didn't come to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. That's where he here. He laid down all his humanity in heaven, all his glory, all his splendor. He laid it down, put it to the side, and took up form as a man. And came into this world and lived just like you and I did, or doing right now, without sin. People say, well, you know, I can't do it. No, it's not you can't do it. The fact of the matter is, do you want to do it? That's the question. The Bible says in the book of Philippians, said, what? I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So that negates the fact that it's no matter what I want to do, it's not what I can do. What do you want to do? You can change if you want to change. You can quit if you want to quit. You can move forward if you want to move forward. You can change if you want to change. The question of the matter is, do I want to change? Do I want something different than what I'm experiencing right now? If you want to experience something different, guess what? You got to do something different. You don't need no PhD to figure it out. You get tired of foolishness, and guess what? Enough is enough. I need change and I won't change. Well, let's do something different. Let's try something different. And guess what? And before you long, you begin to experience something different by the grace of God. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9, it says, We can make our plans, but God determines our steps. You have everything you want to do, you want to do it in light of God's plan for your life. It's not about me. Let any man first deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Jesus. It's not about what I want to do, how I'm going to do things, whatever. Guess what? No, it's about you, God. I want to put you first. When I make a decision or whatever, guess what? I want to make a decision that's going to affect my household. When I was in the military again, I didn't do crazy stuff. Guess what? Because I know for a fact my decision is going to affect my finances. And my finances would impact my family. And I don't want that to happen. 
And then over there in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, it says this. Verse 21 says, you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. You can make the plan. And that's why sometimes you start doing things or whatever and things change or whatever. Because God has to interrupt your plan sometimes so you can get in line with him. That's what he did, Paul. Paul was on his road to Damascus, had a search warrant, had, had, had documents to persecute more Christians, whatever. Until he had that Damascus Road experience, God interrupted his plans so he can be able to understand his real purpose in life. And that's what needs to happen sometimes happen to us. But sometimes, even when our plans are interrupted, we still don't get it sometimes. Sometimes it takes us to go through some dramatic experience before we get the poem, before we get the message. And sometimes, depends on what it is, sometimes we still don't get it. It's not because God don't want it to get it. We choose not to get it. Because what God wanted and what we want does not coincide with each other. And since I'm in charge, then guess what? I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. When a person, um, when a person, when a person finds purpose in their life, two things normally happen in their life when they find purpose in their life. One of the things will change is the attitude. The attitude and the relation toward people changes. It's amazing to me how can you be in Christ and have some of the attitudes that people have in Christ and some of the the hatred people have toward each other being in Christ. How can you love God whom you has not seen and hate your brother whom you has seen? The Bible says you're a liar and the truth is not in you. But when you find purpose in your life, one of the things you're going to notice is your attitude is going to change and your relationship with people is going to change. And see, in order to have a good relationship with God, it's important to have a good relationship with people. People say, well, I love God, I hate people. That's not true. That's total deception. Because God, God died for people. He didn't die for buildings and trees and cars and all that stuff. For God so loved the world, meaning people. God loved people. If you love people, then it's a good indication that, guess what? God is working through you. But you can't have all this hate and bitterness, whatever. That's why Peter asked the question, God, how many times shall I forgive? Seven times? Jesus said, no. You forgive as many times as necessary. Not just seven times. Well, once they do something seven times, then I can quit. And some people are not. Some people count that. They did seven times. I can't forgive you no more. No, as many times as necessary, you forgive. Because you don't forgive, I can't forgive you. That should be more, that should be something that we should think about when we hold all this bitterness and resentment in our hearts against other people. And when we do that, you're not hurting other people, you're hurting yourself. Because you don't want to be held back. They are controlling you and you don't even know it. That's why you have to let it go. So God can work in your heart by the grace of God. If you do that, guess what? So the relationship an attitude to a people going to change. The next thing you know when purpose, when a, when a purpose find purpose in life, you're going to notice this. The spiritual eye is going to become open. Just like Brother, Brother Allen was saying earlier, your spiritual eye is going to open. You're going to see things that you couldn't see at first. Like Paul. Paul could not see himself the way he was acting toward other, other people. He, just, he was just doing his own thing, just like most people. You don't see yourself the way you, that you really see yourself. When you see yourself in the mirror, outside of Christ, you really don't see your real self. You see an image of yourself. But when you become, when you, when, when you have an encounter with Christ, when you truly submit yourself to God, you look at yourself entirely different by the grace of God. Because then you start looking through the eyes of God, start seeing things through the eyes of God. Just like, just like the, um, the 12 spies. When you look at things, the 10 looked at it 
being in fear and doubt. Caleb and Joshua looked through, were looking through the same eyes, but through the eyes of God, look at, look, looking at the situation in, in faith and victory. You look at things different. You can look at the same thing, but see things different. And that's why it's good whenever you're in Christ to be able to see things, whatever. If you could really see what's going on in your life, some of the decisions that you're making, the way you're living your life, some of the things you're doing in your life or whatever, if you could really see that, I guarantee you a lot of decisions, a lot of things you're doing, you're doing right now, you probably wouldn't do it. You stop doing it. I don't know about you, but I know I did. I stopped doing it by the grace of God. And when your heart is, when your heart is uh, purpose-driven, guess what? It's easy to overcome temptation. Because you know for a fact, but you don't want to do anything that's going to interfere with your relationship between you and God. Your relationship between you and God should be so tight, so tight, and so wonderful to the point, you don't want nothing to disturb that. No alcohol, no drugs, no sex, no nothing. You have a respect for that relationship that great. And when you do that, guess what? Just like something I wouldn't do with Hilda, because guess what? I don't want her to do it to me. I realize the relationship we have with each other. I may get away, I may get by, but I won't get away. So you got to know that. And because, because you know for a fact, it's an honor to have a good relationship with someone else. It's a blessing. And when you break that relationship, it's like breaking your your favorite glass or your favorite plate. You can glue it back together, but guess what? It's never the same. It's never the same. Because in the back of your mind, that thought is always there. It's always there. That's why you don't want to do it. Because you don't want to violate that situation. Just like David. When David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, he did what he did, but guess what? That's why in Psalm 51, he said he asked God, restore unto him the joy of his salvation. He had lost the joy. He did what he liked, but he did not like what he did. He enjoyed what he did. But there were consequences for what he did. And then he lost his joy, broke the relationship between him and God. See, when you got that relationship between you and God, you don't want nothing to disturb that by the grace of God. And you can't go over that in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 39 and verse 8 and 9 in King James. You know the story about Joseph. Joseph had a dream. God had a purpose for Joseph's life. And the devil was doing everything he could, if you study the life of Joseph, to interrupt or to change the purpose God had for him. And Joseph could have done, done it at any moment when he was in jail. All that good stuff. He could, he could have interrupted the purpose God had for him. He could have said, well, you know, hey, God understand. But Joseph stayed faithful to his conviction that he had between him and God. Even on that in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 39 and verse 8 and 9. But he what? He refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, my master wrought not what is with me in his house. He said, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I am. Neither has he kept, kept, um, kept back anything from me but thee. And because of that, thou art his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and do what? And sin against who? Pharaoh won't know why I wound. He probably never even knew about it. Not then. Probably later. But guess what? He was not concerned about what Pharaoh was thinking. He was thinking about his conviction between him and God. And see, that's what I'm saying. See, when you purpose in your heart that you're not going to do something, even when you're in temptation, going through different challenges or whatever, guess what? 
You're going to stay true to your conviction. Now, if he had decided that, not decided that in his heart, he probably may have yield to that. But guess what? He did not want to sin against him and God. That's what it's all about. You stay true to God, God will stay true to you by the grace of God. And when it comes to having a purpose-driven heart, most people that has a purpose-driven heart, you're going to find these these four qualities that I'm going to share with you this morning. The, the four C's, as I call them. The four C's. Number one, you're going to find commitment. That person is committed. They made a commitment to God. Not a partial commitment. They are committed to God. By the grace of God. They have made a pledge. They made a vow. They have assured themselves, guess what? Going back to that, that budget. I'm not going to do this. I don't care what they do or what they say. It's not going to change my position. I'm sticking with it. That's my word. That's what I said. And I'm sticking with it. It's just like the Gorilla Glue. You stick with it. Can't pull it apart. I'm in it to win it. By the grace of God. First seed. Second seed. Confidence. A, purpose, a person that has a purpose-driven heart, they got confidence. Not so much confidence in themselves. Remember that in the book of Hebrews, chapter 25, where it said, to cast not away that confidence, which has great recompense of a war. The word confidence also means faith. They have faith, trust, by the grace of God. They have faith and trust. They have, they always stay calm. They never, they're not easily rattled. In other words, not easily disturbed. One moment they, they're up, a few minutes later they're down. They're always calm. They don't have the spirit of timidity. It's not there. They're not, they're not afraid. They always stick on. Because when you know something, when you're assured of something, why should I be afraid and be fearful if somebody tried to call me another name other than John Henderson? They didn't want to got a problem, not me. There's no argument. There's no con- contest. I know who I am. When you understand your identity in him, which you find by the grace of God, guess what? Everything changed for you. You look at yourself different. You even treat yourself different. Treat yourself. If people don't treat you with respect, you show them how to treat you by showing them respect by the grace of God. Don't get in a ditch with them. You stay out of the ditch. If a man don't treat you right as being a woman, guess what? You don't have to stay with that guy. You teach him how to treat you. But if you accept anything, you'll fall for anything. If you got standards, maintain your standards. You set the standards for yourself. Nobody else set them standards for you. How you're going to live, the way you're going to live, what you're going to accept and what you're not going to accept. You don't want to decide that for yourself by the grace of God. If they can't live up to that standard, guess what? Maybe you need to pray and ask God for for wisdom. What is your next step? What is your next move? It's important. Don't nobody decide for you. Just like being in again, going back in the military. The military already got a standards. Then you decide how you want to set your standards. Whether it's going to meet the military or you're going to set your own standard, which may be below the standard that they have set for you. But you decide. For those of you who have been in the military, you know that people come... They in the middle of have different standards. But there's only one standard. And that's a high standard. And you decide where you want to fall in that level. So not only is commitment, not only is confidence, but number three is conviction. A purpose driven heart has conviction. They don't try to be the, they don't try to decide. They know what they're going to do. Whatever they, if they go to a party, if they go to a a situation, find themselves in a situation where go to a home or whatever, they already know what they're going to do. If they're exposed to something that they normally, there's a temptation for them, guess what? Because of their conviction in their heart, guess what? They're not going to flop like a fish. 
They're not going to give in just, just to be accepted by the, the hostess or, or hostess or whatever. They're not going to do that. They'll be polite about it. Just like when I was in the military, it's not to the point I, I, don't, I don't have anything against drinking because I used to be a drunk myself, whatever, but I just made a decision. Drinking is not for me. I don't drink other than just a Coke or whatever. They used to have the wine, beer, and liquor, and all that good stuff. I'd give me a Coke. I'd give me a Sprite. And I was happy. I didn't need all the other stuff. Because the joy of the Lord was my strength. Amen? I learned to enjoy God by the grace of God. And because I did that, I had a lot of tremendous respect for my superior. Because they respected the fact that stand I took. I had one time a guy who heard me talk about a guy named Horace King down in Fort Polk. He said, in Fort Hood, he said, man, I tell you, right after I got saved, he said, I've seen many things happen in life, but i never seen a person change like you change. And this way he told me, quote, he said, you know, when I first saw you, after you said you had given your life to Christ, I thought, I said, well, it was just a fad, it probably won't last. Because I knew how you were. But man, I tell you, you were in this thing to win it. And I was. I've always been like this. Whatever I commit to, I'm in it to win it. I'm not going to do it unless I plan to give it 100% by the grace of God. So conviction. In other words, my views, my opinions, my belief and everything is associated with my conviction by the grace of God. I'm not saying that you can't enjoy life. I'm not saying that you can't go to parties, go to movies, bowl, and fish and do all golf and all that stuff. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying to walk around with sackcloth and ashes on it. Everything you got to say is is quoted by King James or whatever. I'm not saying that at all. Because just like you can live a lie, you can also tell a lie. And you want to make sure that your life reflect your conviction. Last but not least, courage. Commitment, confidence, conviction, and courage. You you just you not you just don't have fear. You're not afraid. You're not afraid to be who you are. If people don't like those saying go, they don't like your apples, tell them don't shake my tree. Hey. Just because they don't like you, somebody else may love you. Don't get in where you don't fit in. Because you're putting yourself in a a hostile situation. You put yourself in a situation where you can easily be rejected, whatever. Remember back in the day when we were back in school? Had these hostile friends. Had these little little cliques. And all of you to. To be, a, be in that in that little clique, you have to, your mom and dad have to have a certain type of job. You have to live in a certain type of house, have to drive a certain type of car and all this stuff. Cliques. And because you didn't fit in that clique and you didn't, you didn't fall into that category, you were not accepted. If you're not out there running around, sleeping around, hoarding around or whatever and stuff like that, you're not accepted. You're not hip. And people fell for that. They put, a lot of girls and guys put pressure on themselves to try to get in where they didn't fit in, not realizing they were doing some of the best things they would, could have ever done in the world. Because guess what? They don't have to, now after getting married, go through all this comparison stuff. Comparing him with her, her with him, and all the other crazy stuff. Because I don't care what you do, the devil never going to let you, never let you forget stuff. If you haven't know that, if you haven't realized that, keep living. He will always remind you of all the negative stuff that you've done. So if you want a purpose-driven heart, you need to make some commitments. You may need to make, be able to have confidence, conviction, and courage. And if you show me a person that has a purpose-driven heart, I'm going to show you a person that has has these four qualities that operate in their life. 
this is how they're operating. And this is the things they operate on. And I'm telling you, God can help you. If you don't have it, you're missing something, God can help you get that by the grace of God. And when you do, your life will never be the same by the grace of God. Is God good? All the time, God is good. Amen? Let church say amen. amen. Praise God. Purpose-driven heart. Well, this morning we ask you if you need a prayer. The thing this morning, we'd like you to come to the front. We pray with you. Um, we thank God for all you here or know us some